We're starting early.
sweet Hosanna's ring. The people of the Hebrews with palms before the went. Our praise and prayer and anthems before thee we present. O glory, Lord, and honor to thee, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet Hosanna's ring. To thee before thy passion they sang the hymns of praise. To thee now I exalted our melody we raise. O glory Well, good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to you this morning as we really enjoyed that procession again. Uh, folks, yeah, give yourselves a round of applause just for being here and praise God this morning. So let's hold up our palm crosses as we say these prayers and as we're going to bless them as well. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. We say together, Hosanna to the Son of David, the King of Israel. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Dear friends in Christ, during Lent, we've been preparing for love and self-sacrifice for the celebration of our Lord's death and resurrection. Today we come together to begin the solemn celebration in union with the church throughout the world. Christ enters his own city to complete his work as our Savior, to suffer, to die, and to rise again. Let us go with him in faith and love, so that united with him in his sufferings, we may share his risen life. As you continue to hold up your palms. God our Savior, whose Son Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem as Messiah to suffer and to die. Let these palms be for us signs of his victory, and grant that we who bear them in his name may ever hail him as our King and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. As we gather at the Lord's table, we must recall the promises and warnings given to us in scriptures, in the scriptures, and so examine ourselves and repent of our sins. We should give thanks to God for his redemption of the world through his Son, Jesus Christ. And as we remember Christ's death for us and receive the pledge of his love, resolve to serve him in holiness and truth all the days of our life. We call to mind our sins and God's promises of forgiveness. Cast your burden upon the Lord, and we will sustain you. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Give us the joy of your saving help again, and sustain us with your life-giving spirit. Children, everyone can go back to their seats. Thank you very much. Or off to Sunday school, Friday school at this point. Thank you very much, young people, for joining us. You can wave your palms as you go. And as they leave, we continue in prayer. We say together, Lord God, we have done evil in your sight. 
We have sinned against you alone. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your unfading love. Wash away all our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, who is both power and love, forgive you and free you from your sins. Heal and strengthen you by spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray the collect prayer together. Eternal Father, your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, fulfilled your will by taking our nature and giving his life for us. Help us to follow the example of his humility by walking in the way of the cross through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading. A reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 50, reading from verse 4 to 9. The Sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being instructed. The Sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the Sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, have I set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who then will bring charges against me? Let us face each other. Who is my accuser? Let him confront me. It is the Sovereign Lord who helps me. Who will condemn me? They will all wear out like a garment. The moths will eat them up. This is the word of the Lord. The appointed psalm for this Palm Friday is Psalm 31, reading verses 9 to 16. Let us read responsively. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress. My eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. My strength fails because of my affliction, and my bones grow weak. Because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbors and an object of dread to my closest friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. I am forgotten as though I were dead. I have become like broken pottery. For I hear many whispering, terror on every side. They conspire against me 
and plot to take my life. But I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. The second reading is um, from the Paul's letter to the Philippians, um, chapter 2, reading from uh, verse 5 to 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in uh, very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That name, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of, of the Lord. Please stand as we sing that other favorite hymn around Palm Sunday, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. Hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ according 
according to Saint Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpeg and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they tied it, some people, untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus has told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches. They had cut it in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the gospel of the Lord. our heads in prayer. Almighty God, our Saviour, grant that our hearts may ache for a lost and broken world. May your Holy Spirit work through our words, our deeds, and our prayers, that the lost may be found and the dead made alive, and that all your redeemed may rejoice around your throne, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. It's Palm Friday. And historically, it's probably the best time to celebrate it because it was on a Friday that Jesus would have gone into the temple area and the temple precincts. As Jesus enters as the Messiah, as the Christ, into these precincts 2,000 years ago. We have heard the story before, and yet still it captures our imagination afresh and anew every year as we hear it again. On one level, it makes us ponder this question, who is this man? And it's a very good question, who is this man? This Jesus of Nazareth, who is this man who is born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman? Who is this man who grew up in still another village near the Sea of Galilee, where he worked in his father's carpentry shop until the age of 30, the age when rabbis would start their ministry, and then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher, going from town to town, synagogue to synagogue, house to house. Who is this man who never wrote a book, who never held political office, who never had a family or owned a house, never visited a big city other than Jerusalem, never traveled more than 150 kilometers away from the place where he was born, did none of the things 
that maybe the world associated with greatness. Who is this man who at about 33 years of age saw the tide of public opinion turn against him? At one point, his best male friends ran away, yet the woman followers stayed behind. Who is this man who was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial, who was nailed to a cross between two thieves, and while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property that he had on earth. And then when he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave, a tomb, through the pity of a friend. Who is this man? After 20 centuries have come and gone, but today remains the central figure in the history of the world, the fulcrum around which history revolves. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not affected the life of us humans on this planet as much as that one solitary life of Jesus the Nazarene. And so, as we turn to the last week in the life of Jesus, and as we do, we cannot ignore his messianic attributes, nor can we ignore the fulfillment of prophecy. As we enter this Passover week, what do we see? We see Jesus arriving in Jerusalem and riding on all things a donkey. Why? What we need to understand is that this triumphant entry was not just a parade like you would think of parades today. Each element deserves to be understood. For one thing, the palm branches which we waved just now are deeply symbolic of victory and of triumph. It goes back to the time of the Maccabees, about 150 years prior to this. Passover was a time that existed when the people expected the Messiah would come. And that's why the city of Jerusalem was full of Roman centurions and why Pilate was in the city that week. So the crowd excitedly imagined that Jesus was entering Jerusalem and maybe he came he will, or he would be coming as a political and as a military hero, ready to become the new king, ready to overthrow the Romans. However, Jesus did not come on a fancy steed, a fancy horse. He did not come with a military marching band in front of him. When he asked his disciples to secure a donkey or colt for him to ride on, the choice echoed the prophet Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it's a statement of humility. The king of Israel has come in peace. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on the colt, a foal of a donkey. You see, it's another defining moment in the life of Jesus. You know, life is made up of many experiences. Your life is made up of ups and downs and victories and defeats, good times and bad times. But sometimes there are those snapshots in our life that kind of capture and imprint on our hearts something special. And we call those defining moments. These are moments in times which are part of the kind of tapestry of our history, of our life history. Think about it. Things like when you first got married, or you had your first child, or you matriculated, or you got your first paycheck, or you passed your first driver's license and dad allowed you to drive the car for the first time. We remember these things very vividly. But in a spiritual sense, Palm Sunday or Palm Friday was a defining moment for Jesus' earthly ministry. In the first year of Jesus' ministry, it had been incredible. There were signs and wonders. There was healing. There was discernment. There was proclamation that the kingdom of God has come. In the second year of his ministry, he starts consolidating his message, and he trains this group of disciples around him, these Talmudin around him. But in the third year, he starts coming up against very intense opposition from the religious leaders of the day. And so I encourage you today, use your imagination a little bit as you place yourself in the Holy Land and in the setting of the ancient Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Jesus knows he's going to the cross. 
And there's no turning back, as that song goes. In his book, and it's one of my favorite quotes of all time, Max Lucado says this in his book, And the Angels Were Silent. He says this, Forget any suggestion that Jesus was trapped. Erase any theory that Jesus had made a miscalculation. Ignore any speculation that the cross was a last-ditch effort, an attempt to save and salvage a dying mission. No. In the journey to Jerusalem, it didn't begin in Jericho. It didn't begin in Galilee. It didn't even begin in Bethlehem. The journey to the cross began long before as the echo of the crunching of the fruit was still sounding in the Garden of Eden. Jesus was leaving for Calvary. It's profound when you grasp that. Since the beginning, God has known that humankind would struggle and that Jesus would have to be part of the rescue plan for us. It's the story of two gardens, Eden, where Adam and Eve failed, and the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus restores the disconnect between us and God. And as he makes his way to Jerusalem with his disciples for that Passover, remember when you went to Jerusalem, you always went up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's on a hill. Nobody ever went down to Jerusalem. You always went up to Jerusalem. And they used to sing psalms as they did that. And as he does so, Jesus passes again through the Judean wilderness where he was tempted three years previously for 40 days. It's barren. It's rocky. It's dusty. And I wonder what he was thinking when he passed through that desert place. He's on his way to die. He's on his way to the cross for your sin and my sin. He must have wondered, is there no other way? But again, he presses on towards his mission. He leans in to his mission. As Jesus enters Jerusalem a few days before the Passover feast, knowing probably deep down that his heart is set on the cross, he looks over Jerusalem from the east, from the direction of the Mount of Olives, and he looks at the bustling city that lies ahead of him. And as Jesus enters on this day, Mark shares with us, it would have been the same time that the Passover lambs were being selected for each family group on that Friday. And so he comes down the hill into the city. And so what happens? This is what Matthew records in his gospel. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hoshana to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hoshana in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And so on this day, this Friday, when people would choose the perfect lamb for the Passover, On this day, the Lamb of God enters the city among the crowd, riding on a donkey to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah. Don't miss this point. A shocking fact about Jerusalem and the temple at the time of Jesus was this. If you were any way physically disabled, that is, if you were blind or lame, you were not allowed to enter into the temple precincts. Why? Because it was thought that King David had cursed the people with these disabilities a thousand years before Jesus came. In 2 Samuel chapter 5 verse 8 it says this, On that day David said, Anyone who conquers the Jebusites would use the water shaft to reach those lame and blind who are David's enemies. That is why they say the blind and the lame will not enter the palace. The blind and the lame and the children couldn't enter into these courts. Matthew records it this way. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, that's Jesus, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the rabbis and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hoshana to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what the children are saying? They asked Jesus. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read 
from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. So aside from Matthew's healing, this mass healing at the temple, Jesus only performed two miracles, healing miracles, in Jerusalem. He healed a paralyzed man, and he healed a man born blind. Think about it. What do the blind and the lame and those rejected do as soon as, they, as Jesus heals them? They go straight into the temple where King David said they couldn't be. That Jesus has come and Jesus has reversed the curse that was set upon them. And then all hell breaks loose in a very good way. When Jesus healed the blind and the lame, the children sang, Hoshana to the son of David. It was praise that was reserved for the Messiah. So the temple officials said to Jesus, Sure, make these children keep quiet. Hush the children. And Jesus says to them, in effect, he quotes Psalm 8 verse 2. Don't you get it? Don't you get it? Psalm 8 verse 2 says that infants and braves will speak God's praises. And so, as Jesus crested the hill, the people began to shout out, Hoshana, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Their cries, Hoshana, save us, deliver us. The Bible also tells us that Jesus wept as he entered the city. The people were stirred up. They came to welcome the Messiah, but Jesus wept. This was the second time in a few kind of weeks that Jesus wept. He wept for his friend Lazarus, who had died when he saw the grief on the faces of Mary and Martha, his friends. If you understand the Greek translation about this weeping, when Jesus wept for, that, for them, it was a silent weeping. It was a sorrow weeping for his deepest friends. But now as he comes and he looks over Jerusalem, the Greek word for weeping here means that he wept in convulsive sobs. He was sobbing. He was lamenting over Jerusalem. And then what happens? Seeing Jesus on a donkey and the people throwing their cloaks on the road before him, the people began to praise God. They raised their voices, as I've already said, to such a level that the religious leaders tried to hush the people. Be quiet. You're disturbing the peace. Tell them to be quiet. Of course, they feared, and I suspect the emotion and the shouting that greeted Jesus. They feared the Roman reaction to that. They feared this Jesus who questions their integrity, who undermines their authority. And amidst this breathtaking sight of beauty, these watchtowers that surround the temple precincts, and Jerusalem's crown, the temple, which is right in the middle, we see what happens. Amidst all of this, Jesus weeps. He weeps with this kind of racking weeping as he weeps over the missed opportunities of God's people. God repeatedly sent prophets. He sent teachers. They rejected them. They stoned them. They killed them. And now Jesus is facing the same thing. Matthew records one of the most frightening, prophetic, and powerful judgments on the people. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. He heard their cries. He saw their future. And he knew the people. His people were seeking peace in the wrong way. Jesus had another way to plead peace, another way for battle. Luke tells us that Jesus says to them, I tell you, if they keep quiet, these stones will cry out. And so Jesus weeps over Jerusalem for God's chosen people. Jesus knew as he wept that the battle for peace, that the battle for the sense of shalom could only be won on the cross. Before the week had ended, Jesus the king who rode in on a borrowed donkey would lie in a borrowed grave. How does Jesus cry for you today? Does he cry as your savior and friend for the brokenness and sorrow of your heart? Does he cry with you 
when he knows the burdens of your heart? Or does he weep bitterly because he has come as the Lamb of God for you and maybe you've missed it or you've just taken it for granted? This triumphant entry day, Jesus reveals himself as king, but he's not the kind of king the people have been looking for. Jesus came for you and for me as the king of kings, but his kingship would be different. He came as a servant king, a king who was willing to give his life as the Lamb of God to usher in this new kingdom. And so finally this morning, as we prepare our hearts for the celebration of Easter week, the coming of Good Friday and the cross, Easter and the resurrection, I think it's important for us to pause and maybe ask ourselves one or two questions. What are we looking for in a king, in our Messiah? Are we willing to recognize him as king, as the Lamb of God that he truly is? Do we recognize him as the servant king who gave his life that we might have forgiveness for our sins and we might have eternal life, be reconnected with God? Do we recognize him as the Savior who weeps with us in our sorrow, who weeps with us in our sin? Are we willing to be part of the ushering in of the kingdom and to be the servants that he's called us to be? Again and again, we will reflect on that question. Who is this man? Who is this man? And how have you responded? It's a question for us to ponder this holy week. As we join Jesus as he moves in his journey towards the cross. Who is this man? But more importantly, who is this man to you? Let us pray. Jesus, we thank you. Thank you that, the know, that you know the answer to the cry for peace in my life and the nations that so desperately need peace in the world today. But particularly we pray for the Holy Land. We know so little of the true peace that you offer. Thank you for your tears. You weep with me in my sorrow. Help me to understand that as you refine the character and compassion in my life, sometimes it can only come through suffering and through struggle. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrificial love that you carried into Jerusalem that Passover week and onto the cross for your glory and my salvation. Thank you for being my servant king who saves. Teach me what it looks like to be a part of ushering in your kingdom as the servant you call each one of us to be. Amen. Please stand now as we share our faith in the Apostles' Creed. We say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated again as we go into our time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, how lovely is thy dwelling place. Our souls long for the courts of the Lord. Our hearts and our flesh sing for joy to the living God. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. 
It's from your dwelling place, Lord, from your courts, from this house, this place, that we pray for our needs, for the needs of others, and for the needs of this world. We think of our needs. We pray for ourselves here in this church where we may need healing, whatever that may be, of body, of mind, or spirit. We pray, pray for forgiveness. We pray for discernment. We pray for direction. We pray for reassurance. We pray for wisdom, Lord. Whatever it may be, it's personal. And you're our personal saviour. And so to you, the great intercessor, we present our own prayers this morning. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we've heard and we think of your approach to Jerusalem and you wept, as we think of your weeping, we think of your compassion. And therefore we come to you for the needs of our friends, of our families, for those we pass in the street, for those we don't know, who we may read about. And for them, we offer up our prayers for healing, for peace, for challenge, for conviction, for love, and for reassurance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we are reminded of your entry into Jerusalem, we heard Hosanna, and we hear, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, we know also, Lord, that city shortly afterwards shouted crucify. And that touches us deeply. We know that in this world there are places of great peace, of great light, of great praise, of great joy, of great security. But we're also reminded of places of darkness, of fear, of hurt, of death, of misery, where evil is seen to run rampant. But we know, Lord, you are sovereign. And it's these places that we raise to you now. We think of the troubled areas in particular of Gaza. We think of Sudan. We think of Haiti. We think of Ukraine. And Lord, we commit these and the other places of your creation that are going through turmoil, that the darkness may pass and it may move to light, that the darkness of the soul that is occurring in those places may be dispelled through your holy intervention and your sovereignty and that light and peace may reign. So we ask for the rising of the peacemakers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And with that, Lord, we think of our leaders. We think of the leaders in the clergy in this church. We think of the leaders in this land. We think of the leaders in our own countries. We pray for the leaders around the world. We pray for your sovereignty, Lord so that peace again may reign in your creation. So that the fall that we heard about, and the stand that we've heard about, may glorify you afresh. So Father God, please accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Please stand as we pass the peace and in the spirit of Palm Sunday, Palm Friday, can you join hands across the aisles as we join, as we greet everyone. So just join hands where you are and across the aisles, so in the spirit of unity. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. May the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. We offer you a sign of peace. Peace be with you. 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 Please do be seated once you've had a chance to pass the peace. one or two folks coming down to join me to make announcements today but just remember that we have our special prayer rooms the one on my left where the glass window is and right at the back of the church so if during communion you'd like to have some prayers um, I do encourage you to go and be prayed over there as well I'm going to jump to Holy Week while Chindu and uh, Vincent come forward just a reminder this coming week as we enter Holy Week Monday, Thursday, we'll be having our foot washing service and our admission of counselors to office at 7.30 on, on, on Thursday evening. It's the beginning of what we call the tradium, which is the three services that end on Easter Sunday. And so I do encourage you, come and be part of that. Good Friday, here next Friday, again, same time, here at 11. We'll be looking at uh, one of the teachings by Max Lucado, uh, he chose the nails, and so that is our theme for next Friday. And then our Easter services on Easter Sunday, the Tamil service, for those of you that want to join that, will start at uh, 4.30 in the morning, so they bring in the light. Uh, the English service will be at 11, and then the evening we'll also have a service at 7.30 as well. Vincent and Chindu, if you want to come forward and you can just share around the prayer seminars and others. Just a reminder, too, that the uh, Tamil Church is putting on a vacation Bible school that starts on Saturday. If your young children would like to come and join, it's open to all of you, or to all the children. It runs from 5 in the evening to 8.30 at night. Uh, so please, 8, at 8 p.m. So 5 to 8 p.m., uh, starting on the 23rd, going through to Wednesday. So Saturday through to Wednesday, every evening, if you'd like to come and be part of that. Please come forward, Chindu. Good morning, church. My name is Chindu Kurubilla. You'll probably recognize me from the back of my head because I'm usually up there conducting the choir and mostly on the organ console. Now, as you have been hearing for the last couple of weeks from Reverend Mark regarding a couple of teachings and prayer seminars led by Reverend Dr. Rachel, founder of Faith Ablaze International Ministries, she has been to our church in 2018 and held a seminar which was a blessing to our members who attended. Now, my wife, Rachel, and myself have been serving God through fame since 2015 as volunteers and coordinators. A bit of background on Dr. Rachel. She's an equipper of pastors and leaders since 2002. She's also an international Haggai facilitator as well as an author and conference speaker. Now, the seminar details are as follows. The Epistle of Philemon on April 3rd will teach us to exercise the grace and love of God towards our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Living as a true witness for Christ on April 6th, the participants will be able to assess their journey in Christ determine changes needed and create transformational goals to live as a true witness of Christ. Resting in God on April 13th, kindly note the timing is 8.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. The participants will examine the theological basis of rest and determine its implications for deeper growth in Christ. 
Kindly do scan the QR codes to sign up to confirm your attendance. And most importantly, please uphold the entire sessions in your prayers. Thank you. Good morning, church. The Epiphany Church Choir will be hosting a music ministry retreat titled Worshipping at the Next Level of Glory. This will take place on the 2nd of April from, nine, sorry, from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. At this interactive retreat, participants immersed in God's spirit of humility will be further motivated to engage with the Creator God who writes new songs in all our hearts. This session will be led by Reverend Dr. Rachel R., founder of Faith Ablaze International Ministries. Alongside the choir members, we are inviting all members of the music ministry, including the praise and worship team and the congregation, to come and join us. If anybody is interested in attending, please contact Rachel or Shindu for registration. Just watch for the back of his head, and you'll know who he is. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Vincent, and thank you, Chindu, for coming. Please, folks, do come and join us for those uh, seminars as well after Easter. Just again to remind you that the bishop will be visiting with us from the 27th of May to the 31st of May, uh, once he's consecrated, and he will be doing confirmations. We will be doing a confirmation classes again for those that weren't signed up in October, in May, and we will be available to sign you up from April onwards. So not today or next week, but from April onwards. And then again, remember the thrift store is always looking for volunteers. If you'd like to join that, um, if you want to join the praise and worship team, please do speak to Emmanuel or Nick or one of the others. Um, we're always looking for food for our food drive. Our link communities are up and running, and our prison ministry is always looking for Bibles as well. And then today after the service, please do join us downstairs for a hot cross bun. I'm sure you're all looking forward to that, especially tested last Sunday night. I assure you they could. So join us downstairs after the service. Just remember, it's Ramadan. You can't eat anything outside of the building. Please just respect that as well. We move now to our offertory, so please join us. There is a green hill far away outside a city wall.
All things come from you, O Lord, and of your own have we given you. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. For us it becomes the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. For us it becomes the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Almighty God, good Father to us all, your face is turned towards the world. In love you gave Jesus your Son to rescue us from sin and death. Your word goes out to call us home to the city where angels sing your praise. We join with them in heaven's song. Father of all, we give you thanks for every gift that comes from heaven. To the darkness, Jesus came as your light. With signs of faith and words of hope, he touched the outcast with love and washed the guilty clean. The crowds came out to see your son, yet at the end they turned on him. On the night that he was betrayed, he came to table with his friends to celebrate the freedom of your people. Jesus blessed you, Father, for the food. He took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we proclaim the mystery of faith. Therefore, Father, with this bread and this cup, we celebrate the cross on which he died to set us free. To find death, he rose again and is alive with you to plead for us and all the world. Send your spirit on us now that by these gifts we may feed on Christ with open eyes and hearts on fire. May we who, and all who share in this food offer ourselves to live for you and be welcomed at your feast in heaven where all creation worships you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As our Saviour taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We say together the prayer of humble access. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands run clean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table, but you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we, with the whole company of Christ, may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen. Dearly beloved, the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with great thanksgiving. If you're visiting with us today and you're a baptized believer who receives communion in your own church, you're welcome to receive communion in this church. The body of Christ.
Please stand as we pray together. Eternal God, comforter of the afflicted and healer of the broken, you have fed us at the table of life and hope. Teach us the ways of gentleness and peace, that all the world may acknowledge the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God the Father, who does not despise the broken spirit, give to you a contrite heart. Amen. May Christ, who bore our sins in his body on the tree, heal you by his wounds. Amen. May the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, speak to you words of pardon and peace. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. God singing a favorite hymn of this church soon and very soon. Okay, bring the water. Husbands downstairs in the Philippi and the conference room. Go now to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen.